people here giving God praise. And we're going through, we're all going through something. Amen. But we're praising him anyhow. Because he's still God. And he's still good. And he can still bring every chance. Amen.
This is going to be the third sermon in the seventh sermon series. Try to say that fast a few times. <laughs> this is the third one. What we're going to be preaching about today is bitterness versus forgiveness. Bitterness versus forgiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that the reason why we are doing these sermons, these series of sermons, is something that will help. We're asking the Lord to lay these messages on your heart to help you to make the changes, to make adjustments in your life so that you can walk with Jesus a little bit closer. Get yourselves ready. Because if these things today, if they're going to they're touch you. They're going to touch you. And you're going to identify what it is that I'm talking about. And we're going to try to handle some of that today. Amen? Amen. 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 So bitterness versus forgiveness. My focus statement of the day is that in order to be completely free from our past, we must forgive those from our past. Yes, Amen? Amen? And my function statement of the day is that we are to be merciful just as our heavenly Father is merciful. Yes, Amen? Now one of the most powerful tools that the enemy uses to keep us in bondage is unforgiveness. Yes. Do you know that? Yes. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness left to itself does nothing but fester inside of us. Affecting our attitudes, our behaviors, and turns us into unhappy, bitter ogres. Even our facial expressions change. You can see it all the time when you're walking around out here on the streets of, of uh, San Pedro down here in Skid Row. Every one of us that was down here, we know that there's been issues, things that have happened to us that cause us to want to be bitter. People have done things to us that, man, every time we think about them, our facial expressions change. Okay. Amen? Okay. Do you know what an ogre is? You guys have heard of Some of you know, we, we, get the, we get the comedy thing with um, Shrek. Now, Shrek was an ogre, but Shrek was a good ogre. He liked to party and have a good time and laugh, make you laugh. But when you look at the, the, uh, the history of what ogres really are supposed to be, they're hideous monsters that feed on human beings. Always, always angry, always upset, doing terrible things to folks. Ogres, when we get those kinds of feelings, it changes us. It changes the way that we feel. Do you know that it takes more muscles in the human face for you to frown than it does for you to smile? So it takes, if you got something that's causing you to be bitter, you, you put it on, you put it in overtime. And then you put it in overtime. It's difficult. It's a problem. So you gotta watch out there. So what happens when you don't forgive? Well, all of us have heard the sermons that address this issue. We hear time and time again, don't we? And that's good. But this time, we're going to go, to, we're going to go and we're going to take this just a little bit further. So that we can feel the results of unforgiveness. First of all, we know what the Bible says about unforgiveness, don't we? The question is, is do we obey it? It's important to understand that... Without forgiveness, we stay under the power of the enemy because he now has the right to enter your life and wreak havoc. A lot of people don't understand. The more that you want to become like Jesus, when you forgive, is the closest that you'll ever be. Forgiveness. When you forgive, you are more like Jesus at that time than you ever have been. Now, that kind of disobedience that we're talking about, that you're displaying, that we're talking about, is not an accident. Okay? If we disobey God by accident, it's not hard to go to Him and ask for forgiveness. Is it? Now, I'm not talking about that kind of, of, of unforgiveness. I'm talking about disobedience that is intentional. Disobedience that is intentional by displaying non-forgiveness. And what it is, is it's a gateway and it's wide open for Satan to enter into your life. Disobedience that we do accidentally is something that we can confess immediately and then it's over. 
But when we commit sin intentionally by not forgiving someone, the highway to hell has just been opened up. And the more that you refuse to forgive, the more bitter we become. And the faster we go, breaking the land, speed breaking, heading down that highway to destruction. Highway to hell. I should eat it up. <laughs> but that's what happens. We gotta watch out for that. Now there's many ways to allow Satan into your life. And when he comes into your life, you need to remember that he is not there to be your friend. Do you understand? Satan, though, when he comes into your life, he ain't coming in there to give you a pat on the back and send you on out to play and everything is cool. What does the Bible tell us about that? He is here to kill, steal, and destroy. He came from Jesus himself. So, who has he come to kill? He's come to kill you. He wants to kill you. He wants to, let me tell you something. Every time that Jesus, I mean, every time that Satan has come into my life, he ain't here to help me. And he came in a couple of times, gave me bags of dope. Back in the old days. But why was he doing that? He was trying to kill me. You guys know what dope will do to you, don't you? He came to try to kill me. Why does he want to kill you? Because he knows if he kills you, you're out of the way. You ain't gonna do anything anymore. You can't you, you can encourage anybody, you can't be an example to anybody, you can't praise God anymore. Because when you praise God and you lift his name on high, what does it say? He inhabits the praises of his people. But if you ain't here to praise him, you're out of the picture. So you need to understand your willingness to sin, your willingness to unforgive. You open up the door for Satan to come in, and he's coming in to try to take you out. Okay? What's the next thing? What does he come to steal? He's come to steal your joy. Let me explain something to you, ladies and gentlemen. Your joy is something different than your happiness. And your happiness, as you can tell, the word is derived from the word happening. So we get happy when something in our happenings is okay. We get happy about it. But you see, what does that mean? That means that as soon as something messes up what's happening around you, you lose your happiness. That's not the same as the joy that God brings into your life. Joy, when, that, when Jesus gives you his joy, what does he say? He says the world can't take it from you. Can't take it from you because the world didn't give it to you. Jesus gives you that joy. He gives you that joy deep down inside that is always with you, no matter what. No matter what is going on. I got sisters and brothers in this congregation that are going through some heavy things right now. Yes, sir. They've gone through some heavy things. But let me tell you something. Jesus has got you by the hand and he is walking you through your thing. Amen? He's walking you through. He is imparting to you joy that nobody can take from you. Because joy that is in your heart. How does that work? Let me explain to you. Whatever is going on in your life, whatever happenings are going on around you that's stealing the happiness in your life, that's okay, because the joy that's there, that Christ has brought into you, that means that everything is already handled. Amen. And that when the time comes, you are completely okay. Amen? Amen? That's what that is all about. So he's come to steal your joy. He wants to take your joy so that you lose that feeling, that, that feeling inside you that lets you know that everything is all right, no matter what. Also, what has he come to destroy? He's come to destroy your testimony. Let me explain something to you, ladies and gentlemen. Each and every one of you, when you walk with Christ, when you forgive people the way that you're supposed to, and you do it, you are a testimony. You are an example for people to look at. And there's a lot of people, and down here in this church, there's a lot of people that got an eye on you. Because they say, well, that love is a Christian. That sister is a Christian. What are they like? What are they like? And they're watching your behavior. They're watching. They say, let me tell you, you think that they ain't watching Pastor Tony? They're watching me like a hawk. <laughs> you know, Pastor Tony. Yeah. Could you imagine if I was one of them pastors that was walking outside and going like this? 
somebody into your life and heal a relationship. That's what it's there for. Amen? Okay, and to open, something to overcome. Number two, it says, do not give the devil an opportunity. What's that talking about? Let me tell you something, and I know each one of you knows what I'm talking about. Every single day, the enemy is bringing something to you. He's trying to give your flesh an opportunity to mess up. Listen, nobody, the devil didn't make you do it. The devil did not make you do it. I don't care what Cliff Wilson said. He did not make you do anything. But what he does is he brings you opportunity. Because you know why? Because he knows what your flesh wants to do. He knows what your flesh wants I can tell you right now, there's a lot of brothers in here. I can tell you right now, you're here because you love God. I know that. You're here so that you can be a part of what's going on and so that you can receive this message. But if I said to you right now, if some beautiful woman, especially the kind of woman that you like, comes up to you right now, and she says, Hey, big boy, come on with me. How many of you would be weak in the knees and mess up? That's true. That's true. Come on, I got a couple on us, guys. So, <laughs> so you guys, so you guys, like, man, I can't raise my hand. My girl's in here. <laughs> Amen. But that's the way it is. See, we love God. We know we love God. We're here. We're here at church for a reason. When some girl came up to you, man, and she gave you that opportunity, are you going to take it? you got to ask yourself that question. Because let me tell you something. We need to get to the place in our lives where our relationship with Jesus Christ means more to us than that girl, than that fleshly thing that wants to happen. Okay? We need to try to, we need, that's what we want to work toward, to overcome that kind of stuff. Amen? Amen. Now, what's the, what's the importance of that? It's important because when you overcome that kind of stuff, you're showing God that you've grown. You're showing Him that you're growing and maturing in Christ the way that you should. That you are no longer that person that falls by the wayside as soon as somebody bats their eyes at you. You know what I'm saying? You've got to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. Don't let that happen to you. And if you've got somebody special in your life and she's getting married to her, that means you ain't supposed to have your hands on her in the wrong way. Go out there, buy a ring. Get yourself a ring. Even five dollar ring. Whatever kind of ring that you need to put. She's going to understand the situation. But then you come to Pastor Tony and you tell him, Pastor, I need to marry this girl because I can't keep my hands off. And I will help you to stand before God the way that you should. Amen? Put a ring on her finger. Tell her I do. And just make sure that you don't. Okay? Now number three. It's telling us about stealing. He who steals. A thief opens up another door for Satan to come through. Being a thief is one of the things that opens up the enemy's door, lets him come in real tough. Because I remember back in the day, you know, when you're homeless and you're drug addicted, you'd be doing all kinds of stuff to try to come up. That's right. You know what I mean? I'd be doing stuff, man, and, and I know Satan is coming in. Because he has been doing some crazy stuff. Yeah. You know, and so we've got to be careful with that. You know, we ain't supposed to be taking nothing. The Bible tells us, get a job. Go get a job so that you can make money, honestly. And even if it's not that much money, that's okay. God, you keep following God, he'll bless you with something better. Amen? So just make sure. I remember there was a guy back in front, back in, uh, some of you guys might know about a Bible tabernacle. Yeah, I was there for a while. And so I was there, and there was this big brother who used to come and he was there. I had this beautiful blue t-shirt. It was kind of multicolored. It was great. And back then, I was in great shape. <laughs> now, I put that t-shirt on and fit me good, you know? And this brother, he saw that t-shirt. He wanted that t-shirt. I, I liked it too much to give it to him. So I had all my clothes in this closet. 
I was looking for my shirt one day, man, and my shirt was gone. And I looked for it, and I looked for it, and I knew, I thought about it, I said, I know that brother got my shirt. I just know it. So I went through his stuff and found it. Found that shirt. So I went to him, I said, man, why you stole my shirt? I didn't see your shirt. I said, well, I found my shirt in your bag. I said, that I didn't put it in. I didn't get it. I, I, I don't know who took it. And I said, look, man. I said, I know you took my shirt. I said, you keep denying it. I said, I'll tell you what. Let's pray about this. Okay. So we started to pray. I said, Heavenly Father. I said, we just want to bring this situation before you. I said, my shirt was taken. I said, and it ended up in this man's uh, bag and his clothes. I said, we just want to handle this. And so I gave him the floor. I said, you go ahead and pray. He began to pray and he said, Lord, you know I didn't take that shirt. And I said, wait a minute, hold up. I said, hold up. I said, I can't believe that you're going to lie to the Holy Spirit. I said, don't you have any fear of God at all? I said, don't you remember what happened to, to uh, Ananias and Sapphira? They lied to the Holy Spirit the same way that you're doing right now. I said, and the Holy Spirit just took their life just like that. Don't you have any fear? That's blasphemy. That was straight up blasphemy. He, he lied straight. To, see, when you're talking to God, and you do something like that, you're talking to God and by to God. <laughs> do a, that is blasphemy. You are really, really taking your life in your own hands. But I told him, I said, man, I said, you know, I had to talk to that brother until he finally, he finally caught to it. And I said, now don't you feel better, you know, just get that off of your chest, off of your shoulders. I said, hey, get my shirt off of your back. <laughs> But you know, it's like, we just need to understand, you know, those kind of things, and we shouldn't take things that don't belong to us, because they give Satan an opportunity to open up a door and come into your life and cause you to even lie to the Holy Spirit. The next one says, no unwholesome word. Now, let me tell you something. It's talking about when you use language that you shouldn't use, and I know I'm talking to every single person in here. Every single person in here, including myself. You've got to watch out for that. I don't use bad language the way that I use it. I don't, I don't do that. God really has done a work in me with that kind of thing. But let me tell you something. The enemy is here to steal your testimony. And there is probably no better way to steal your testimony than to have you stand up where people know that you're a Christian and have you cussing out somebody. And it happens a lot. You'd be surprised how many times I'll watch some of you get up and you got to raise the door. How do you raise the Get outside. Well, you know what you mean? <laughs> and the next thing you know, here it comes. Just pour it out your mouth. Like a money group. Cussing somebody out. Just, just letting your language just take over. I and mean, what is it? You're letting your anger. You're letting your anger dictate to you what you say. That's not the way that you have your anger help you. That anger's not helping you. That anger's causing you to sin. That's why it says if you're angry, just don't sin. So you need to keep that and watch out for that because Satan is trying to steal your testimony. You know why he wants to steal it? Because if he's got your testimony, you are going to become null and void to anybody who's listening to you. Amen? That's the way it works. If I walk outside here, and I, and I start cussing somebody out. Everybody else goes, did you hear Pastor Tony? Did you hear what he said? I lose all my testimony. There'll be no power for what it is that I do. Amen? So I want you to keep all the power in your life that you can possibly keep. And whether you do that is hold on your testimony. Make sure you do the right thing. Make sure you don't let no voice of work come out of you. <laughs> Amen. Now also, number five says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. All the things that we just talked about beforehand, grieve the Holy Spirit when we do that. Why? Because we belong to Him. 
Listen, we don't belong to ourselves. We were bought with a price. The, the sinless blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And so we belong to Him. When we do these things that we just talked about, that grieves the Holy Spirit. It hurts the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, I can, I almost, I, I can almost see my, I can almost see the Holy Spirit just going like this. Oh. Do you know something? I know the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. Do you want to know why? Because he already knew what I was going to do. <laughs> Amen? He already knew what I was going to mess up. And he loved me anyway. And he will love you anyway. Now that doesn't mean that it's okay. Just because he's going to love you anyway. It doesn't mean that it's okay for you to go out and do the things that, you do that we just talked about. What it means is that you love him so much that you want to straighten yourself out and not do those things. Amen? Now, also, it says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice, all of these things. We need to let all of that stuff go. Now, what exactly are we talking about? Bitterness. Bitterness. Let me tell you something. That's what this sermon is all about, bitterness. When you let something sit inside you, where you let it fester and it gets, it gets all infected inside your spirit and allows you and allows you to get all messed up in your mind, where it even affects the way that your face looks. When you're bitter, ladies, and when you look at folks, and there's a whole different thing on your face. And like I said before, it takes more muscles for you to, to be bitter than it does for you to be happy. Come on. So you want to get rid of that bitterness. You want to let bitterness go. Wrath and anger. We just talked about that. And let me tell you something. What does anger do? Anger makes wrath step out. What is wrath? Do you know what wrath is when you get mad and the next thing you know you're out there fighting and carrying on? You know, that's what we do, isn't it? We let wrath take over. And wrath, wrath takes over, man, and the next thing you know is like, what did you say? What? 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 And the next thing you know, you're throwing down. Yeah. Why are you pointing at him? <laughs> you can tell me about it later. But see, we got to watch out for wrath, don't we? Let me tell you something. There's a, there's a time for all things. The Bible tells us that in Ecclesiastes 3. But you got to make sure it's the right thing that's going on. It's going to take you there. There's a time when wrath needs to come out when you're protecting somebody. You're protecting your wife. You're protecting your kid. Somebody's trying to do damage or harm to you. Now there's a time for you to show some wrath. And we don't show no, we don't get scared. We don't get and turn into wimps. You need to stand up and take care of your own. You're protecting. That's what God made you into, man. You got your woman, you got your kids and stuff. You're supposed to handle it. If you can, try to talk them out of it. You know, now look, 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 don't do, you know, don't, I, I told you not to do that. <laughs> no, but you got to watch out. you got to protect them. But then that's what God, God gave that to you. That is your responsibility. But you know something? I, before I go to that, I try to pray my way out of it. I try to pray my way out of it. Most of the time, it's not a problem. But sometimes the enemy has a, has a straightforward attack on you, on your family, on, on your loved ones. My wife will tell you, I don't put up with no mess if somebody trying to hurt my wife. Because she's the best person that I know. Amen. Amen. we got to watch out for that. Clamor. What is clamor? Clamor is when you acting up just loud talking and just out there just doing all, making all this noise and talking all this mess. You know, that's what clamor is. That's the clamor is. And you know something? You ain't supposed to be out there trying to bring attention to yourself by talking loud and being all boisterous and all that kind of stuff. God is not pleased with that. So get that out of your life. Calm yourself down. Be the man of God that you're supposed to be covered. Slander. We know what slander is. You ever have somebody slander you? Yeah. Talk about you? Say something terrible about you? Let me tell you something. I've had some terrible things said about me. And, and the thing that's really, really great, and I want to share this with you, if you are a man of God, if you are a woman of God, and somebody slanders you, you don't have to defend that. 
Don't even say nothing about it. Pray about it and give it to Jesus because he says that he will have it. Every time that somebody did that to me, I didn't have to worry about nothing. I turned it over to Jesus and let me tell you something. The things that were said about Pastor Tony from long ago, four years ago when I became the pastor here, some people that didn't want me to be pastor had lied on me, said all kinds of terrible things. I prayed to the Lord and I left them in his name. Do you know not one of them is here now. Some of them are even dead. Yeah. Some of them died. Some of them died and the ones that didn't die are not even here. So you just, I, you know, completely, I have, I have always been completely exonerated from anything that's gone on with somebody who's lying about me. Amen? Leave it up to Jesus. He handles that business. He does. And malice, the last one, malice. You know what malice is? Malice is when somebody says something terrible against you who's trying to hurt you. They're trying to hurt you with the things that they say. Yeah. Hey, we're not supposed to be like that, ladies and gentlemen. We're not supposed to be trying to cause people pain from the things that we say. We're supposed to be trying to bring reconciliation with one another and with God. That's what our job is. We have the job of reconciliation. We're not supposed to be talking about somebody trying to make them look bad or trying to say terrible things about them. Amen? Amen. All of these things are roadways for Satan to gain access to your life. That's why it's imperative to take to heart verse 32, which says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Amen. When we ignore this commandment, all we're doing is we're heaping bitterness into our heart to the point that it can begin to affect us, even physically, yeah. causing us to lose our joy while we exhibit a life of bitterness and discontent. Yeah. Now, what exactly is forgiveness? Well, let's start out by explaining what forgiveness is not. Now, ladies and gentlemen, open your hearts and your ears up right now, because this is important. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Do you understand? Forgiveness is not forgetting. First of all, people who try to forget, they find that they can't forget anyway. So if forgiving is not forgetting, what is it? Well, let's see what God says about it in Hebrews 10, 17. It says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. That's right. That's right. So, sure sounds like forgiveness is forgetting, doesn't it? That's right. But let's examine the text and let's reason with it so that we will have a better understanding of what was just said. First of all, we need to understand God is omniscient. Omniscient means He knows everything. He knows the past, He knows the present, and He knows the future. In fact, God is the possessor of all knowledge. Past, present, and future. So you can't surprise Him. You can't do anything that He doesn't already know. So he is omniscient. So what does that mean? That means what he's actually saying is that he will never use your past sins against you. Everything that you've done, every sin that you have ever done before and ever will do, he will never use it against you. Amen? Amen. Forgetting may be a result of forgiveness, but it's never the means of forgiveness. Okay. You understand what I just said? Okay. It may be the result of forgiveness. In other words, if I forgive you what you've done, and I really forgive you, I might just get all about what you that's did. Right. Yeah. So that's okay. But I don't need to forget what you did in order to Give. That's right. Amen? Amen. So what he was saying is that we really didn't forgive them at all if we continue to remember. Okay. If we're bringing it back up, we're still harboring resentment in our mind. Another thing that we need to keep in mind is that forgiveness is a choice. 
if we say to ourselves that I can't forgive that person, all we have done is we've chosen not to forgive them. We know that forgiveness is possible in every instance because God has commanded us to do so. He would not command us to do something that was impossible for us to do. So we are all capable of forgiving. We just have to make the right decision and choose to forgive. Now, I must admit that forgiving someone can be quite difficult sometimes. Because it goes against our sense of justice. Yes. We want revenge against those who have hurt us. But we must remember what God said. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Amen? And it's the truth. He does take care of us. So how do we deal with situations where it's hard to let the offense go? When we're dealing with our sense of justice, we may ask ourselves, why should I let that person off the hook? Ladies and gentlemen, that's precisely the problem. They're still on your hook. As long as they are still on your hook, they have power over you. You're still hooked to them. Still bound by your past. You need to let them off of your hook and remember that they are never off of God's hook. Sooner or later. And you'll do it fairly. Which is very difficult for us to do because our sense of justice is flawed. Each and every one of us, when we want revenge or something like that, don't we want to give out a little more than what we're supposed to? If somebody did something to you, hit you in your mouth, don't you want to go like this? <laughs> give them just a little extra. That's what we, that's what our, that's what our sense of justice wants to do. It's flawed. We want to give out a little more than what it is that we're supposed to. Now I've heard it said, well, you don't know how much they hurt me. But don't you see? They're still hurting you. They're still hurting you every time you think about it. Every time that person's name comes up in your mind. Every time a picture of their face comes up in your memory. It's still hurting. That's why it's important for you to let it go. You don't forgive someone for their sake. You forgive them for your own sake. So that you can be free from them. You need to forgive. Your need to forgive is not an issue between you and that offender. It's an issue between you and God. So don't let the sin of unforgiveness allow Satan to enter your life and cause you more pain and suffering than you're really going, uh, going through. Don't let Satan's bitterness creep into your life, destroying your joy. You will find so much more happiness when you have learned to let go of the wrongs that have been done to you. Forgiving them for your own sake, but trusting God to take care of and to deal with the offense that you have endured. My name is Anthony Stallworth, and I'm a senior pastor at Central City Community Church in the Nazarene. We're located at 419 East 6th Street, downtown Los Angeles, on the corner of 6th and San Pedro. We are a church that serves the Skid Row community, so I'm sure that you can imagine that it's difficult for us to support our ministry with the tithes and the offerings. If today's message has helped you, perhaps you would like to come alongside Central City and prayerfully consider helping support this ministry by sending your tax-deductible gift to Central City Community Church, P.O. Box 13273, Los Angeles, California, 90013. Thank you.